screen. I think this works. Are you able to see it now? Yeah, that's okay. Okay, so thank you very much for inviting me to this um, the webinar, which I think is a very good idea then to, to give students and, and, and graduates almost uh, the, the opportunity to see what is available in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, all the opportunities I have heard uh, from the previous presentations uh, that there are many, many possibilities. And even within regulatory science, there are already many possibilities. Uh, myself, as you also said, I am already more than 20 years active. From when I came from university, I immediately took on a job in regulatory science. I had jobs at local level, at regional level, at global level. And now I'm back in a sort of regional but local country focused role. Um, I must say I have never worked so hard now, but also with so much passion, because when I see what is developing in, 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 the, in the world of pharmaceuticals, um, the collaborations between the industry, the academics and the politics to, to, get, to get really new medicines with high unmet need to patients, that is really incredible. So I think the future is bright. Um, for all of you when you are interested in taking a job in pharmacy, pharmaceutical company or health authorities. So, and this is uh, a slide that I just show you uh, how broad the possibilities are when you are taking a role into uh, regulatory sciences. You can have a global role that is in headquarters and there, and I will come back to that later in more detail, is that you can have a role either in a global regulatory strategy or in regulatory policy. You can have a role in a regulatory operations. And I, I will come back to that to say what it is. And then you can also have a role in global regulatory CMC and CMC stands for um, chemistry manufacturing and control. And then after uh, those global roles that are mainly based in headquarters of companies and for Bristol Myers Quick where I work, these headquarters are based in US, but we also have headquarters in UK and in Switzerland. Uh, you can have then also those regulatory roles locally, be it in Europe, be it in Japan, in China, and also in other countries which we call uh, regulatory sciences, Intercom. This just to show you that it is very international, you can have those different uh, possibilities all within regulatory science. I will focus now more on Europe because that is where I work or where I have had my career mainly and I think where also you are based but again it would not stop you to take another role in another geography uh, in, in the world or another area. Um, so in Europe, as I said, you, we, we, I, we, have, we are structured as three pillars. Uh, first of all, regulatory strategy and policy. And this is really the people or the group of, or the department that provide uh, the European regulatory expertise and the scientific and regulatory input into drug development programs and regulatory submissions to the health authorities, meaning that we are working there with all our internal stakeholders, with clinical development, with preclinical development, as you heard already from previous speakers there, with CMC, um, to make sure that the whole development of a product is, is following the right rules and is following all the guidances that there are. It is also those people that have the primary contact with the health authorities. In Europe, the health authorities are the EMA, the European Medicines Agency, now based in Amsterdam. They came from London, but after the Brexit, they, um, they are now based in Amsterdam. Um, the policy group, uh, they are linked very closely with the regulatory strategy group, is really the people that are looking at having 
the right focus. There is happening so much externally. And as a company, you need to follow those external rules and ex those external developments and have the right focus, um, such as the European Commission has just uh, published the uh, pharmaceutical strategy for the EU now. And this means that they are going to look at um, designing and improving the patient access to safe and affordable medicines, but keeping an eye always on the innovative and the possibility of innovation by the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, a second pillar is regulatory operations and regulatory operations is in fact the department that will be responsible for making sure that all the documentation as there are the clinical study reports, the preclinical study reports, the manufacturing information, etc. That that is going in the right format the way the health authorities want it. And also they are uh, the, the, the people, the, yeah, the professionals that are looking at the labeling. They're going to write the labeling, the, the SMPC, as we say, the summary of the product characteristics. They are writing the package leaflets and all that also needs to go in the dossier. So you have the content on one hand, the format on the other hand, all to prepare the submission, the marketing authorization applications. And then you have also the functions that are uh, the regulatory functions that are based in the individual countries, uh, and they have to ensure the implementation of the strategy uh, that has been defined mainly by headquarters uh, in the respective countries. There are many, and I will also come back to that, tasks that need to uh, be done at a local level. And um, it is these people that have really the contact with the national health authorities. And you see all the logos on the slide of the national health authorities. You have the, the FACH or the IFMPS in Belgium. You have INSM in France. You have the Medicines Evaluation Board in the Netherlands or CBG, MHRA in the UK, Swiss Medic in Switzerland. And all that are national health authorities with whom we also need to work because many of those or the European, uh, the EU uh, national health authorities, they are part of the CHMP, which is a, 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 the, the, the scientific committee that is working at the level of the EMA, which is a coordinating agency of the European Commission. It's a little bit technical, but it's how we work as a regulatory science department with um, with the health authorities. Here, uh, if I would need to present to you a job description of uh, a regulatory science manager, uh, you can see that um, the core business of, of course, to drive the regulatory vision, to provide that strategic leadership to your headquarters, to manage the regulatory processes, in line with the business, as you heard also from Vicky, what does the business want? What do we need? On the other hand, we also have our R&D objectives. What are our possibilities? We need, of course, to ensure a timely registration of new products and line extensions and to ultimately uh, obtain the marketing authorization for a medicinal product to bring that to the patient and to keep it also alive after approval, um, we have uh, to do that. Then uh, to do all that, we need to be on top of the pharmaceutical legislation and the development of all the procedural guidance. There is a lot of legislation, there is a lot of guidelines that we need to know, that we need to follow. Um, this seems boring, it is not at all boring because it changes quite a lot. Um, we have to drive then also effectively the inconsistent communications with the health agencies, with the EMA, and also with the local health authorities. And um, what is the most passionate, I think, is to explore innovative regulatory procedures and practices. Uh, meaning, do we always need to have a full-blown uh, phase three trial uh, in our registration dossier? Or if our phase two is uh, compelling data, can we already go in there and that's 
when it comes to negotiating with the health authorities on on what what is needed, what can we do to bring that that product earlier to the patient. Um, also, we are locally then in more in the countries uh, a key partner to the medical and the commercial organization. And again, as Vicky uh, already mentioned, regulatory is there as a partner to make sure we provide support to the medical functions, to the commercial functions. We are also uh, the gatekeepers there to make sure that everything what they do is really according to uh, rules and regulations. Uh, we are also a partner with the pharmacovigilance or the drug safety functions and the GDP uh, functions, as uh, mentioned by Iris. Uh, and then finally, last but not least, we are also the department that are going to submit the clinical trial applications, the CTAs, to uh, the competent authorities, as explained uh, by Benedict earlier on. And we also contribute to the implementation of early access programs in line with our policies, but also again in line with local legislations. Early access programs are the programs that we put in place to give access to medicines before they are actually approved by the regulators, but that is in case that uh, there is a high unmet need and there is no treatment. And we think that our treatment is very promising. Again, here, a lot of discussion with health authorities, negotiation with health authorities to get, again, that product that is so much needed to the patient. So the future regulatory professional, um, what are the education what is the education what are the skills that we are looking for so first of all i would like to say a couple of words about the job because the job um, has evolved from an administrative function to now being really a strategic partner strategic partner internally with the uh, clinical development with the, 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 the chemical development with the business as well, with the people that need to uh, look for pricing and reimbursement, but also externally, we are a partner with the health authorities. Um, we need to understand end-to-end -end development process and interdependencies because we always need to know uh, why we do what we do. Science and technology is evolving very rapidly and regulatory is in the driving seat of all these evolutions. Uh, relationship with health authorities and the company, it is a partnership definitely and, uh, and a transparent communication need to be fostered there. And uh, you start with an academic background but you learn on the job and you add capabilities on IT, uh, on cell therapy, on uh, digital therapeutics, et cetera. It always comes on top of that. I, I can say I have more than 20 years in regulatory science. I have never been bored uh, because it's changing. The environment is changing so rapidly. So what we are looking uh, for education, uh, we, the people that apply for regulatory jobs are uh, masters or have a PhD in life sciences. We have many pharmacists, we have MDs, we have uh, biomedical, um, all that is, is really, uh, the, from the moment you have a science background and, and, and you, you can apply for the job actually. And then it's not enough to have a master or a PhD, uh, but you need also other skills. And um, I would say that what is necessary are strong negotiations and empathic skills, because you're dealing with so many stakeholders. Uh, you are working in a complex matrix organization, so you need to be a trusted partner. Strong communication skills, as I already mentioned, internally, but also externally with, uh, with your health authorities. Uh, of course, the digital capabilities are uh, nowadays uh, something that, that, that you always need to have. And then finally, I would say uh, people need to be flexible, agile, but most of all, I would uh, invite people to be curious. Curious in the asset, in the product, in the therapeutic area, in the disease, but also in the environment, what is happening in my company, but what is also happening, happening outside of uh, my company. 
And then finally, to close, uh, job opportunities, uh, as you already heard uh, from, uh, from, from previous speakers, is, uh, of course, in the Bayak Pharma Company, where I work, uh, where it's a big company, there are many different roles, uh, as you can say, at the global level, at the regional level, at the local level, be it in a strategy position, in a policy position, or more an operational role. Um, you can also find jobs in startups, in, but in a startup, you are not uh, an expert in one area. You need to be uh, some kind of an expert in the many areas, and there you then work with uh, CROs um, who can help you, and that is uh, again, as also Benedict mentioned, it's 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 an area that is increasing, and that is the next uh, possibility is to go and work for a CRO, uh, which are have uh, different specialized areas, and that is the private sector. But you can also go into the public sector and really work at the health authority. Be on the other side, I would say partnering with industry to make sure that medicines uh, can get to the patient very fast, uh, support all the, also the innovative way of working because most of the time industry is learning, but health authorities are learning together with industry and it is more partnership than ever. And then finally, I also would like to mention that you have the biopharma companies, but there is also the medical device companies. And that is something also an area that is uh, being developed much faster uh, today. We have uh, digital health, we have digital therapeutics, we have apps, uh, all that comes under medical device companies. And there is again also a future here is the, the partnership between pharma and a medical device. So there are really a lot of opportunities, even if you only already look in the world of regulatory sciences. But as I already said, I think the future is bright and there are many, many possibilities. So I'm happy to take any questions uh, later on. So thank you very much. Thank you, Anne, um, for your uh, nice oversight. And now I leave the floor to uh, Luciano for the introduction of the last speaker. Perfect. Thank you very much, Anna. Really very interesting presentation also, Vicky. Uh, now the, the floor uh, is uh, <clears throat> given to Laura Aldrovandi and uh, Simona Sbardellatti from the Tecnopole Mario Ver Veronesi in Italy. And uh, Laura is a senior project manager of the Foundation Demo Center and uh, Simona is the project manager of the D7 Finance SRL. And I have to say that I visited this uh, Technopole, it's a very interest, uh, in interesting reality in Italy, near Modena. And uh, I think there are, again, many opportunities there. And it's good for uh, young people, for students to know also what is a science park and what uh, can be done there. Thank you, Simona and Laura. You are you are muted. Uh, you are muted, Simona. Sorry. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Luciano. Thank you for uh, the presentation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, talk with uh, all of you about our reality, the Technopole of Mario Veronesi. And uh, it's a pleasure uh, with uh, know these uh, speakers uh, who has decade of experience. Uh, I'm a project manager. Uh, I'm a uh, biotechnologies, uh, medical biotechnologies, uh, and project manager since two years. So uh, I'm very young uh, in this field. Uh, I want to share my presentation. Okay, I hope you can see now. Yes, okay. yes, thank you. Perfect. So um, I'm here to talk about the career opportunities uh, in uh, the Science Park. Um, I think uh, the first uh, is to explain uh, what is the Science Park. Uh, the Science Technological Park uh, is uh, an organization managed by specialized professional. The specific aim uh, is to promote, uh, to increase the wealth of its community. 
one of uh, the goal uh, is to manage and to stimulate the flow of knowledge and the technology almost the, uh, among the universities, uh, uh, R&D institutions, uh, companies and market. One of uh, the important things also is to help the growing of the startup and the companies uh, through incubation and the spin-off processes. Science and technological park are worldwide. We can find them all over the world, but they are different uh, in terms of uh, specialization, internal organization, services, business model, company settlement and geographic position. So uh, is, it isn't uh, fine to define a unique example of uh, a science technology park. But uh, they have some elements that could be identified as essential for establishing a successful science technology park. The first one is the presence of the universities and the research center. This is very important to promote the spreading, the, the spreading of the new technologies, the innovation and the knowledge. The establishment of the collaboration between the technology park and all the companies. It's important to know that uh, we, uh, as a Tecnopolo Mario Veronesi, are located in the biomedical district of Mirandola, near Modena, near Bologna. Uh, the biomedical district here in Mirandola is the second at European level. So we have uh, a lot of lab and we work with uh, a lot of companies, uh, any size of the companies, starting from uh, the startup, uh, small and medium enterprises, till, till the big enterprises, uh, for example, Livanova, Eurosets and Vibrown. Another thing very important for the successful science and technological park is the integration of all the policies regarding education. We have a specific course for people from high school, development and research. Cronopolo Mario Veronesi, who we are? Uh, we are one of the vertical division of the Democenter CIP Foundation that is managing collaboration with the, the University of Modena and Reggio Emilia. As I said before, we are located in the biomedical district, and this is very important because uh, uh, we can work with uh, all the company present here. We do our research for uh, ourselves. Uh, thanks to our lab, and we do applied research problem solving for all the companies here. Uh, this is important because um, sometimes companies doesn't have the skill necessary and need and the skill needed in their research and development department. So they ask to to us to solve uh, specific problems. Uh, we work also with the Regione Emilia Romagna. We are uh, in collaboration uh, with uh, the Regione Emilia Romagna and uh, in the Regional High Technology Network, and we are part of the cluster of the life science. What we do? We are uh, experts in product and process development. Uh, in the biomedical field, uh, we, uh, thanks to our uh, lab, uh, work strictly with the companies uh, and work strictly with uh, all the, the startup that are incubated uh, with, uh, in our facilities. When I talk about the support of the company, uh, beside the, the R&D, uh, we, we talk also of the international networking creation for project and fundraising. We support uh, the enterprises, uh, the companies, uh, also in find the best funding in order to, uh, to reach their innovation, to reach the innovation goal. We, are, uh, we have a different lab managed in collaboration with uh, the University of Modena and Reggio Emilia. Briefly, this is uh, what we do in our science and technological park. As I said before, there doesn't, it doesn't exist a unique example of a science and technological park. So here in my presentation, I would like to explain what we do in, a, in our reality. We do research services for innovation and industrial development. We design and co-design of medical and surgical devices. 
we support companies in the product certification and registration. We support also for the for find the best finding starting from the startup that want to accelerate their business for the small and medium enterprises the enterprises that want to accelerate and innovate their product and their processes. And we do technology transfer. We help companies done technology transfer between companies and universities. We incubate and development ideas on the, of the startup. We do education and business development. This is uh, uh, briefly how we work. Uh, we work strictly, as I said before, with the companies, with the healthcare system, system uh, through the development of R&D projects. Uh, and the result that we obtain is a new product, a new process, and new services. We defined us as innovation catalyst. We are in the middle of the hospital, the university, in this case of Modena Reggio Emilia, Bologna, in the middle of the startup uh, and the companies. So we work with that together and strictly uh, with uh, all of them, defining the best solution in order to innovate their product. We would like to become a leader in the, our sector, the biomedical sector. Uh, I haven't said before, but uh, we are quite new. Uh, we were in, in 2015. And uh, now we are becoming a, a science and technology park, a biomedical village. This is uh, our laboratory. Uh, the first one is a chemical lab, uh, toxicology and proteomics. And uh, it studied the interaction between the materials and the, the blood. Microscopy, applied microscopy and the cellular biology, it study and uh, it works for the development of uh, new protocols and cellular partner patterns for biocompatibility, toxicity and regenerative medicine. Uh, so in a few words, uh, they study the interaction between uh, uh, materials and cells. The engineering lab uh, studied the design, development, and characterization and validation of few new materials, product, measurement system, and equipment. And the last one is a physical and chemical lab. There is a, another lab, these are quite new, is a usability lab in response to the new MDR that uh, will enter in force uh, next year. So we study, uh, it's a digital, uh, most digital lab, and we study the usability of the medical devices. Here at the Technopole, we are almost uh, 20 uh, persons between researchers and uh, project managers. Um, the degree and the specialization of our researcher is uh, biologists, biotechnologists, uh, chemists, uh, chemists, uh, engineers. Uh, most of them uh, became uh, from the life science uh, universities, uh, belong to life science uh, universities, uh, and uh, identified uh, uh, four different uh, areas, the research, uh, high tech services for companies, management and uh, regulatory. Regarding the high tech services for company and research, uh, I think uh, uh, we can explain this uh, as a research and development department. Uh, that is present, which is present in all the companies, uh, small and medium and the big one. Research is the idea, testing a new product, a new processes, uh, when the innovation start, when, uh, where the innovation begin. The development and the applied research and, uh, is where the idea takes an economical dimension, economical level, as it's transformed into an innovation and a concrete. The R&D department is uh, very important uh, because uh, I think, in my opinion, the innovation is the key to be more competitive in a growing market. In our uh, case, in the Technopole Mario Veronesi, the R&D lab are composed mainly from uh, um, researchers uh, specialized in the life science and uh, engineers. Most, uh, most of them have a PhD, but uh, is not strictly necessary, uh, but is important to define the skills. 
The other department that I would like to talk is the regulatory. Uh, many colleagues before me uh, has explained uh, uh, the regulatory. Uh, the quality management and the regulatory affairs became uh, most important, very important uh, in these uh, recent years. Um, companies uh, used to uh, have um, quality management as, uh, and the regulatory affairs as an advisor consultant. consultant. But uh, in this uh, recent year, uh, it became a, a very important uh, profession and uh, medical uh, device company, biomedical companies uh, needs, uh, need these professionals within uh, uh, their facilities. The regulatory affair study is more focused on the, on the product. They study that the product uh, replies to all the requirements uh, starting from the new MDR. The quality assurance and the quality control are mainly, mainly focused on the process. So, they study that the process uh, is, uh, is okay and uh, the monitoring every step uh, inside the, this process. The last uh, profession that I would like to talk uh, is the management. Here, I would like to, to bring my experience and also my colleague Laura experience. We are medical and pharmaceutical uh, biotechnologies, as I said at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, in my case, uh, I done a master in the biomedical uh, field in management of biomedical devices. Laura, a uh, master and an MBA master and an uh, economical PhD. In our case, uh, we, we work strictly with uh, all the companies, uh, defining with them uh, which is the best instrument uh, in order to, to reach this, their innovation. We're looking for the best funds at the regional, national, and the European level. We work with them in order to define the proposal, writing that, and uh, organize the budget. And we do the project report. So this is a, a very brief overview of uh, which are the main professional present here at the, at the Technopole. So uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Simona and Laura, for uh, this excellent uh, presentation. Again, very useful because I think it's an eye opener for uh, young people on a reality they probably don't know, don't know very much. So now I uh, kindly ask you to stop uh, the uh, to present on the screen uh, your presentation, and I ask all the panelists to turn on uh, their camera so that we can see everyone on the screen. We received uh, uh, many questions in the chat. I, I, we apologize in advance because it will not be possible to uh, answer uh, all the questions. We have, they say, about uh, 20 minutes now for, for the discussion. We will try to have some rounds uh, with the different uh, speakers to address uh, the main ones, but uh, we will not be able to go uh, into all the details. Uh, I will start, Joss, and then I will give uh, the floor to you for the second question. So picking up uh, some ideas from the chat, let me summarize that uh, th there were several questions related to internships, traineeships. So maybe we can do a first round uh, among the, the speakers to just mention briefly uh, from your point of view, uh, what kind of internships are available? Uh, are they available already for students or uh, I mean for uh, recent graduates? Do you uh, require, I mean, a typical question uh, I always see is that, you know, uh, young people are scared about these previous experiences that uh, companies very often uh, require and they say, oh, we don't have that, we need to start. So how would you advise, let's say, let's start with a person without experience, willing to work in a pharmaceutical industry or in a CRO or uh, in general in the industry, industrial sector, uh, what kind of internships uh, are available concretely. And also, let's mention also the numbers because sometimes we do have opportunities, but the opportunities are, the numbers is so low that basically for the high numbers of graduates that we have in Europe, uh, it's not easy for them to grab these opportunities. So let's try to be very concrete and uh, indicate to our young participants, you know, some uh, practical uh, tips. Who would like to start on this general and difficult topic? Maybe I can start. Thank you. 
You mean? Yes. Um, no, we have had, and that is from experience in, in the UK, when I was heading the UK uh, regulatory sciences, uh, we had a program there uh, for graduates uh, in different functions, be it in marketing, in medical, in regulatory, and I think also in RCO, which is clinical operations. Um, we had a program, it was a one-year program, it was with, in collaboration with, with the different universities as well. We do not have that same program in Belgium, um, where I, I think I'm a supporter of that to organize it, but companies need to be open to do it and it takes a lot of time to set up such a program. But on the other hand, uh, no internships, but I always have, um, I have hired in the past many people came and coming right from university. I think that potential is much more important than experience. And uh, I have very uh, good results with that. So I, I would invite to, to apply and, 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 and take all the good advice that you have is a for, for, for a role and uh, you, you will find people in industry that are happy to hire newcomers or from university. So don't be scared to do that. Perfect, thank you. Anne, who else would like to contribute? Yeah, maybe I can also say something. Um, yeah, like for instance, the, the larger CROs, they, they, they don't call it internships, but they call it like traineeships or something, the starting positions that you go into the large CRO to, to like learn on the job and that are, you are mentored by uh, uh, more senior colleagues. Um, with my own company, I, 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 well, we are a training organization, so we also organize traineeships uh, for our students. Um, and if you're interested in that, you can always reach out to me. Because, well, especially in clinical development, in as CRA, for instance, um, if you look at all the, 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 the advertisements in contrast, to what Anne was saying, if, if you have zero experience, it's going to be very difficult uh, to, to, to find a job because the competition is going to be too high. So everything where you can acquire experience is helpful. And some companies, some CROs or also pharma companies even do offer like shorter, peer, uh, shorter um, internships. Uh, the program that we have at ECCRT is a one year program also uh, that gives you a, a full range of experiences going to uh, from experience in the hospital as well as a pharma company as well as a CRO so that you can uh, learn everything together. Uh, Benedict, as you run a, a training uh, organization, a training company, what type of uh, trainings as type of postgraduate courses or, or, or whatever are most requested uh, for the moment? Well, well it's a need that, that, that uh, it, well, Practical experience in the training, the traineeships is, is, is very much in demand, uh, but also like the basic courses like GCP, eh, because I don't know, there's a number of, um, and actually I teach at the University of Ghent also, I have a course, a management of clinical research, uh, um, and, and, and there we see, for instance, GCP, but not in extent. So what we offer is then a more extensive, more recognized and, cer and certified training also, because which, this is what we, you need actually if you want to have a job in clinical research, you need to be uh, uh, GCP trained. Huh? Yeah. Any other comment? Yes. Yeah. I would like to add something for uh, marketing and medical affairs. Uh, you don't need an additional uh, graduate or diploma or something for uh, marketing or medical affairs. Um, most of the time I start with junior um, profiles who just finished their, their studies. But when you apply um, as a student or, or looking for your first job, then I think it's important to look at uh, trainings that are given by the company, uh, that they put their time and energy in giving you uh, a traineeship and so on. Uh, so that's one thing, as mentioned by the previous speakers, that is very important. Um, we give uh, a training at headquarter and a part of the training is at local level. So you have both and it depends on the function that you start with. So that's one aspect. The other aspect that I sometimes see with um, young profiles is that they immediately apply for the, their dreaming job. And sometimes it's difficult to get there immediately. Um, and some of the students maybe, or pharmacists, for example, they are looking down for the job of a medical rep 
or for the job of the medical science liaison. Uh, I saw it's one of the questions also in the chat box that they think, well, it's maybe not recommended that I do first a job at sales level or as, as an MSL, because then I will not get to the medical affairs department or the marketing department. And it's not working like that. Um, a short experience um, and at, um, on the road, like we say, can be very helpful because then you see how it is going on in the practical day-to-day -day living of a doctor, of a pharmacist and so on. And it's a very big experience that you can uh, take with you for the next time you're going to apply for that job of product manager uh, where you are dreaming for. So don't look down on a first short experience um, because it's very helpful in your further career. Thank you. Well, let me add on, on this topic that, of course, in European Union, we have the Erasmus uh, program, uh, which in the last few years gave many opportunities for the so-called Erasmus traineeships, of course, which are open not only to European Union, but also to uh, associated countries, uh, uh, giving a lot of, uh, again, uh, possibilities uh, to work uh, not only at university, but also in research centers, in uh, uh, companies, etc. So. I really encourage all young people to look uh, at these opportunities. Now, COVID, I think in 2020, made uh, these agreements a little bit more difficult. Many companies were afraid of accepting uh, students, et cetera, because of the regulations. But we hopefully, in 2021, we will go back to a new normal, and these uh, traineeships, again, will be very useful. And also, since I visited uh, personally this science park, uh, Mario Veronesi, we mentioned that could be another opportunity, I mean, to do uh, the final uh, dissertation that is compulsory in many degree programs, uh, that is a compulsory part of the degree program. I mean, in industrial pharmacy in Italy, students, uh, they receive 30 credits for uh, the final uh, work uh, before graduation. So I think, again, it's a good idea maybe to spend those 30 credits to do an experimental thesis in a mixed environment, academic, and the industrial, uh, like a science park, maybe Simona, yes, if you I agree, I agree. Uh, about I agree. that. It's very important to uh, do a, a, a mixed path for a, a young student uh, just degree. It's very important because uh, it's important to, to learn a lot of things, not only in biomedical, not only like science or pharmaceutical. Hybrid uh, knowledge and the skills, uh, it, it's very important. And here at the Science and Technology, Technological Park, we'll uh, have all this knowledge and, uh, and skills, uh, starting from the researchers, uh, since the project manager and the startup. So. Thank you. Uh, Mihai, maybe do you have any questions from the point of view of the European pharmaceutical students for the panel? Uh, maybe we could uh, touch upon, uh, maybe let's say a bit different topic. Uh, how would you personally evaluate personal experiences done in, let's say, volunteering activity, let's say, extracurricular activities, and how important would you see these when it comes to finding a job on the market later and uh, when it comes to actually adding value to the CV? Who would like to, to reply to this? Um... Yeah, I, I would like to start. Um, for me, it's quite important because it reflects a kind of attitude. Uh, like, for example, for marketing and medical affairs, uh, communication skills are very important. If you can see on the CV uh, that you have been uh, engaged in other presenting skills or whatever, that can give for me an example that you are um, that you have a good communication skills and that you are engaged and that's, that can be important. It's certainly uh, as important sometimes for me than postgraduate course. Attitude is more important. It's easier to, to learn knowledge to somebody than to learn an attitude to somebody. So, uh, Thank you. Other, other comments on this? Um... Yeah, I can only echo what, what Figu is saying. It really shows your motivation to if you apply for a job, you need to show that you really, this is your job that you really want. Because if you are not doing this, your competition is going to do it and, and you're not going to have the job. And the only way to do this is to, to, to indeed, to demonstrate this by all means. And, and, uh, and indeed, like, like, because I also saw in the chat that there's like uh, questions around soft skills. 
that's a typical example of some, something that, that you can then show. I, I, do, I want to do that extra mile, that extra step to get the job. Huh? Perfect. And um, maybe Sibel, do you have any, any questions for, for the panel from your point of view? Uh, well, Luciana, actually, I took my notes. Uh, I had really important notes from the speakers because as an academician, it is not easy uh, to show the students the real world and uh, real life, uh, in, especially in the pharmaceutical industry. So I took my notes and I will recommend this uh, also the video to the students. So they have uh, different speakers, different point of views, and especially uh, how they have to start. As I understand, well, we all know maybe they have to start from the bottom, bottom of the uh, job. Of course, they can reach their dream uh, job, but it, it takes some time and it depends how they uh, reflect themselves, as I understand. So the CV is very important. Benedict and all the other uh, speakers explained very well. I took my notes, uh, so I wish I was a student. So I, <laughs> I, I had a lot of experience from uh, the speakers. So they have to uh, be very, very uh, careful on the, their CV. So they have to present themselves very well. Abil their ability to work uh, as a part of a team, uh, problem solving skills, very, very important. So how they think clearly, methodically, so their experiences. And uh, so I would like to thank again to the all the speakers and it was a very valuable uh, meeting thank for me too. Thank you, Simbal. We, uh, we did not have a unique student webinar. I think we, when we were young, that was not available. I have my <laughs> students and I keep taking their names <laughs> from here. <laughs> this is one of the few uh, advantages of this uh, tragic uh, COVID period is that indeed uh, we can do more of these webinars and I think exactly. it's uh, very exactly. easy to organize. So Joss, uh, any, any question from you also based, uh, the, we received some other specific questions in the chat, uh, some of the panelists maybe they also saw them. Uh, let's see if we have time to address uh, also some of them. Yeah, there is, there is one on from uh, a student uh, who graduated in pharmacy outside the EU, and he is asking whether it would be able for him to find a job in the EU market. I don't think that that is an, uh, uh, a difficulty, but maybe some people could ask, uh, could uh, um, have another opinion on that. No, I agree. Uh, maybe I can just jump in here. I, I fully agree. It's not really necessary to have. Uh, a diploma from a European or an EU country. Um, we have a lot of exchanges within the company. Uh, I have people coming from Germany to Switzerland or from Switzerland to Brussels, uh, which is outside of the EU, of course. That is not at all, that is not at all an issue for us. If they are good enough, uh, it's not a problem. Yeah, it may be, it may be just, you know, to be concrete, it can be a little bit difficult for countries requiring visa. I mean, uh, this is not, uh, I mean, Switzerland, of course, is not EU, but is uh, a country very much uh, related to the EU, like Norway, uh, even the UK now, unfortunately, is not a EU country anymore. But uh, indeed, uh, there are some difficulties uh, for uh, students who uh, cannot just come uh, and travel to uh, European Union, but uh, they need an invitation letter, they need a visa application. So that's and also the recognition, let me say the recognition of the titles, unfortunately is not uh, fully implemented, uh, even despite the existence of uh, uh, you know, some conventions, uh, in, including the first one, the Lisbon Convention already quite a long time ago. Uh, th I know unfortunately there are some difficulties. And uh, again, from my point of view, I think this exchange study programs uh, can be a, a good, uh, a, say, door that um, a person can take in the beginning to, to come to European Union and then after that, you know, look for other opportunities, uh, uh, you know, for, for companies, but maybe other colleagues would like to add based on their experience. Okay, if not... So uh, there is a question for Anne, but she might have seen it. Um, which digital tools are used in regulatory for um, the different activities. I suppose the usual ones, <laughs> the new ones. <laughs> yeah, there are there are a lot of digital tools. It's yeah. um, 
we have a lot of databases. We have now more and more. When you go into digital health, we are looking at apps. Even um, it, it's really a very big question here that you that you that you ask. Um, and and I would really need to go into more detail to that. So there is not. We we are using every digital tool yeah. that exists. Thank you. And and there is a question for Benedict. Uh, would you recommend? to first gain experience as a study investigator coordinator in the hospital and then switch to a company, CRO or a CRA or vice versa? That the question was asked by Anna Ockerman. Yeah, well, I can't really recommend which way to go here because a lot depends on, on your personal preferences. I, I see, I see it happened in both directions. I see people going in, uh, starting in a hospital setting, study coordinator or investigator, and then go to the industry. But I also see the other way around. And that's uh, after a while in the industry, people want to go back to where their heart is because the reason for to go to the hospital is that you're more close to patients. And very often I hear a patient uh, that students want to do something close to the patient. And you, you can't get any closer than that. Uh, uh, so. That's the, 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 the own balance that you have to make. Eh? If, if you want to like, go to the hospital first for that, you can then indeed make a switch afterwards to the industry eh, in clinical operations, for instance, but also the other way around is possible for sure. Of course, well, in hospital, your career will be more flat, more horizontal, whereas in, in, in the industry, you'll have more career opportunities eh, to, to move upwards. Thank you very much. And then uh, there are a couple of questions. Uh, I know Vicky already, I think you addressed a little bit uh, uh, them, but maybe we can elaborate a little bit more. So two questions for Vicky. Uh, the one is asked by Gilles Vermeer. Uh, if you want to work abroad in marketing, medical affairs, sales in the pharmaceutical sector, is there any tips you can give to graduating PhDs? Most functions typically require the experience you cannot deliver in the beginning of your career. What entry-level job would add to the sales experience you mentioned? And then the second one is from uh, Vivian. Uh, is it possible to get a job in medical affairs as a junior, so after graduation? As I heard earlier, these jobs mostly needs other experiences. If, <clears throat> if, it, is, uh, if it is not recommended uh, to start, uh, like uh, MSL position, uh, what would you recommend to apply first? I would like to work in the medical affairs field. Um, yes, it's a little bit um, the, the question that we um, have seen uh, in the beginning of the discussion. Uh, for me, it's not necessary to have a specific experience or a specific um, graduate to start at marketing level or at medical affairs department. Um, just, just try, just try. Uh, maybe in the beginning that you can't be too um, specific in what you are looking for and that you have to try. And if it's not working for you after six months, after one year, you can decide to change and, and, and to look further on. But just have your first experience. I think that's a very important one. Um, Regarding the question of, uh, yeah, and just to, to add to that, look for a good uh, company that gives you a good training in the beginning of your career. That's really an important one. Um, and, and take your time. When I'm saying that um, experience as a sales rep or as an MSL can be interesting in the beginning also of your career, uh, it's maybe an experience for six months or one year, for example. Um, so that you know that you have the feeling of, of their daily work. Um, and afterwards, you can, again, apply for another job. Um, regarding the question about experiences abroad, um, I think you have to look at LinkedIn um, and, and, and look at companies maybe who are um, putting their, um, their applications on LinkedIn, for example. Um, what we work with at Servier, Servier is a French company, and in France they have a very interesting program which they called VIE, um, Volontaire International d'Entreprise. I will put the link of uh, their website in, uh, in the chat box afterwards. Uh, in fact, this is a very interesting program um, for French companies. 
French companies because um, it's um, they it's it's um, sponsored also by the French government, and it's for student for young um, young people between 18 and 28 years old, and you can apply there for a job in a French company at headquarter level or at subsidiary level. So, for example, you can uh, apply for uh, working in Belgium or England for a French company, okay? And then you can have a, a nice international uh, experience. Of course, you must be good in languages. Uh, English, for sure, uh, is very important. But uh, it's an interesting website if you want to start with an um, first experience abroad. Thank you, Vicky. Vicky, yeah. could I ask you another question, please? Um, is medical affairs an exclusive hunting ground for medical doctors, or are there also opportunities for other um, qualified professionals to be? No, absolutely. Yeah, it's not at all only for doctors. Uh, you can be pharmacist, uh, biomedical sciences. Um, no, it's it's most important is that you are critical. Uh, in your analysis of scientific uh, literature, that you have a good scientific background, that you are patient-oriented. Um, PhD can be an asset, but it's not necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, you can grow up in, the, in this kind of department. Thank you. Other, other comments from uh, all of you? Any, any other point that you would like to add? Or from you, Joss, any other question, general question for the panel? We need to close in a few minutes. There is still the blunt question of someone about salaries in these different yes. uh, positions. <laughs> Perhaps a difficult one to answer, but maybe you could have some general uh, ideas about that. Yeah, I saw that question too uh, appear several times. Uh, well, I'm afraid I will, again, I will not have like, well, one answer for you. And um, what I would say is, well, of course, you shouldn't go under the market price, but I think the salaries is one important thing if you want to, 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 to uh, look for a job because you, you do this for your earning. But what is for me more important is that uh, it, you, you have something you have a job that you like doing what you're passionate about because that's then you will automatically also make a career in it because you will be successful and then and then the starting salary doesn't matter actually because then automatically you'll 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 move up one one comment and then the other comment is as, as several speakers already mentioned also st start at the beginning eh? start don't aim too high eh? don't don't think you're going to be starting somewhere in the top but start at, at a lower level and also, like adjust your expectations salary-wise to that. I don't expect the sky, uh, uh, but you have to show that you perform. And, and in the company, it is it's how it is. And we have to uh, be, be honest. There, a company needs to perform uh, for to to show the results to the owners or shareholders, and it's all about performance. And and and, and performance is also re um, um, rewarded in a company. Thank you. Is there today more room for um, an equilibrium between your work and, and private life uh, uh, activities? Or is it only a world for workaholics? No, it's definitely something that HR departments now uh, and, and many companies or most companies are looking into is the work-life balance. It's something that is so important. Um, it did not exist so much when, when I was much younger, uh, but nowadays we have a flexibility in, you can work from home, you can go to the office. Of course, now we are all at home, but, but find that balance, uh, your private life, your work, uh, your education, your interests. Uh, it, it, it is a point of attention in, in all companies now. So you can always be a workaholic, but the company is not asking that. On the contrary, I think um, you perform much better if you have you've found that balance. And that is something I think more and more key. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I think we need to really to close. If there is any other 
uh, a comment uh, uh, very quick from uh, any of you. Um, okay, if not, uh, let me thank again, uh, really, uh, EPSA for this partnership, for this, uh, you know, uh, series of events. Uh, and again, I invite all the participants uh, to follow the third uh, webinar, which will be in, in January. On the 25th of January, we will uh, post uh, the information on the UNICA website uh, very soon. Uh, let me thank, of course, uh, Professor Thomas uh, for uh, working uh, so hard uh, on this uh, program and all these other activities we are doing. Uh, Professor Susan, again, a member of the UNICA Steering Committee. All the speakers, uh, really, thank you very much. You gave a, a so interesting presentation, very concrete, very useful for young people. Uh, let me thank all the participants for being online for more than two hours. And this is, uh, again, a proof that uh, students are, uh, they, they like, you know, these uh, kind of activities. I think this is a good encouragement for us to continue uh, in, the, in these activities. And let me thank also the UNICA office, especially Laura Colò. Uh, she worked very hard, uh, you know, from Brussels in, uh, for the organization of this event. So again, thank you very much to all and see you soon, uh, you know, in the next activity uh, you know, in, uh, on the UNICA screen. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>